We're in John chapter 4 this morning. We're going to get through half the chapter. We're not going to be able to do the whole thing. So, uh, in John chapter 4. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he had, he had to pass through Samaria. So let me back up here. Verse... When you're reading the Bible, and you see a parenthesis, right? And that's verse 2, if your Bible has a little parenthesis, that means that the author of the book is adding this to give you a little uh, description of, or a, a little explanation as to what's going on. Like it says, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. So he's just, John just added that in there as a description of what, you know, and we'll see more of that. <laughs> okay, so the route from Judea, or Judea, Judea to Galilee was about 70 miles to the north of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the Jews would never travel through Samaria because they were arch enemies. They would cross the Jordan River just south of the land of Samaria, and they'd cross over and they'd go north and then they'd cross back over on the north side of Samaria. So they just kind of loop around Samaria when they're going up to uh, the Galilee. To the Sea of Galilee area. And that's why it's called the Galilee. The, the Sea of Galilee is up there. and Jerusalem, Judea is, in the, is south of that. Um, but Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Not because he had to pass through, but Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Because Jesus had an appointment with someone there. Not officially, but Jesus had an appointment with someone there. And we're going to see that here in just a little bit. Just a little bit. So the Samaritans uh, were Jews that... that uh, when Syria had taken over the northern kingdom, the Samaritans uh, intermarried with the, the, these Syrians, and so they were the half-breeds. Well, it even goes back farther than them being the half-breeds. It, it goes back to uh, when, remember we were talking about the son of David, this um, Solomon? Well, Solomon's son, uh, Rehoboam, or Jeroboam, one or the other. Rehoboam and Jeroboam, were, they became the two kings. One <laughs> stayed south, the other one stayed north. But uh, he decided to tax the, the, the people even more than Solomon was taxing. So it split the kingdom. And so you had the northern kingdom, which was in the Bible when you're reading, and in kings and in, in stuff, it, it talks about... The, the kingdom of Israel, and that is the northern kingdom, and that was the idolatrous kingdom. Their capital was Samaria. The, the capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. So their, their palace, their, who, where they worshipped, and all that was in Samaria. And so that the southern kingdom in Judah, it was called Judah, they worshipped in <coughs> in Jerusalem at the temple and they worship the true God these Samaritans or this, these northern tribes they fell into idolatry so basically what it turns out is you have the Bible talks about there being the ten tribes of the northern kingdom but what it is is everyone who wanted to follow the true God Jehovah they just migrated south and everyone who did not want to do that, they wanted to follow these idols, they just migrated north. You have Judah being one of the tribes of the south, but people from all over Israel came to the southern kingdom. So there's no lost tribes. God knows exactly where they are. Uh, the, they just It's just how God split, or the, how the Bible splits this up so we can understand there's two tribes in the south, the other twelve or ten went to the north. Well, you have uh, you have uh, the tribe of um, 
It's all the tribes, okay, in the south. You have all the tribes in the north. It's just the difference is who's <coughs> trusting in Jehovah and who's trusting in their idols. And so these Samaritans, because this was their capital city, that's the reputation they got. And then when Syria came in to take over and, and they captured the, the northern kingdom, they intermarried. That's how Syria would defeat a, 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 a nation. They would take them and then they would <coughs> displace them into other areas and have them uh, breed out their heritage, basically. So they became Samaritans then, or they became Syrians. So they, the southern tribe hated the northern or this the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews because it, it was just this blood feud here. So when Jesus said we have to pass through Samaria, his disciples were no doubt thinking, "Oh my goodness, why in the world would we go through Samaria?" They get stoned going through Samaria. Okay. So. Verse 5 it says, So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. See, this is still Israel. This is still the land of Israel, because you have Jacob's well here. And this was about three days. They've traveled three days to get to this spot where they're at now. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which is noon. Let me explain something for you here real quick. We see in the Bible where it talks about it was the sixth hour, the eighth hour, or the, the third hour. So if you remember it like this, from sun up to sundown is your day. Six o'clock is sun up, six o'clock in the p.m. is your end. So six o'clock is your first hour, seven is the second, noon is the sixth hour, and then one o'clock is the seventh hour, two o'clock is the eighth hour, three o'clock is the ninth hour, four o'clock is the tenth hour, five o'clock is the eleventh hour, and six o'clock is the twelfth hour. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> so that's how you remember that, because it's the hours of the, and then you have the watch, which is the night watch. So those are that takes you through the evenings. Through the evening, the the third watch would be nine o'clock at night, right? The fourth watch is ten o'clock. So it's the same as the day. It's just at the night time. Um, the sixth watch would be midnight. <laughs> All right. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about six, the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, nice. What we're going to pick up from this is I've got a few points, some bullet points that we're going to go through. And it's, I called it, it's witnessing Jesus style. Okay? We're going to see Jesus witness to the Samaritan. And we're going to pick out some of the things that he does and how we can apply that to our witnessing, our witnessing tool bag, right? So when we witness to people, we can pull some of these points out and do what Christ did. Uh, it's a little different than what we've seen in the past where you, you have somebody, you know, just his ultimate goal is to bring someone to the Lord. And we've all done that. <coughs> Excuse me. Where, and that it should be our goal, right? We need to show them the Lord. But uh, Jesus doesn't, forget about all the other things just to get them to the Lord. Oh, okay, well, it's going to be, you know, fun and games and all that, so you just need to trust the Lord, right? Uh, just say this prayer and you're safe. You can go to heaven. Uh, instead of witnessing to someone, instead of uh, telling them how to really be saved. And we're going to go through that. So, 
Number one, a man would never have uh, talked to a woman, much less a Jew talking to a Samaritan woman. The woman came in the morning to draw, the women normally came in the morning to draw water. Well, this woman, she was there at noon, the hottest part of the day. She was there drawing her water. So, witnessing Jesus' style, number one, is Jesus initiates the conversation. So in order to witness someone, you have to be able to talk to them, right? So she, he initiates the conversation. He says, draw me some water. Verse 9 says, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? And then John adds for clarification, For Jews have no design, dealings with Samaritans. Right? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So he draws her attention to the true gospel, right? This is So he initiates conversation. Number two, he draws her attention to the true gospel. He gives her just enough to, to make her wonder what he's trying to say. Gives her just enough to, to to pique her interests, right? So she said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get the living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well, and drank of it himself and his and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. So he now, <laughs> the third, the third point that I want to point out here is uh, Jesus gives her a glimpse of what she gains from the gospel. So he entices her, and then he gives her a glimpse of what she could gain from this. He sparks her interest even more. <coughs> But the water that I will give him will become in, in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. <clears throat> Which brings us to the fourth point. <laughs> he gives a little more information, but just enough to pique her interest a little more. <laughs> okay, so, so all these little peaks, little peak a little more, peak a little more, just kind of just giving her a little bit of, just a little bit, a little dab will do you. So she, she keeps listening. Because if you give her the, the whole thing all at once, you're going to lose her, and she's going to know what this is all about, and she's going to walk the other direction. Be like, ah, I don't want anything to do with this. So he just, he knows what she wants, and he knows that she needs this, but he's got to get her to the point where she realizes that this is really what she wants. Okay, does that make sense? The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water, so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. And he said to her, So, she still thinks it's all about the water, right? She don't want to have to come to this well anymore. But he's, he's using the circumstances she's in to bring the gospel in her life. So now what he's going to do is he's going to expose her sin. So, if we don't know what we need to be saved from, then the salvation isn't very appealing to us. So, you know, we, we got to know what we're being saved from. And in this case, in all cases, it's our sin. We have to be saved from our sin. So, he's going to draw that out. So, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now live is not your husband. This you have said truly. So, okay, you need the gift of discernment to be able to do this. Now, sometimes you get that, and sometimes God will give you that gift of discernment to peek, peer into someone's life and be able to tell them, what they did not tell you. But if you don't get this gift of discernment when you're witnessing to someone, then 
you've got to draw that uh, the the sin that we all have in our life. We've got to draw that out in them. So another way to expose your sin is by asking them. Ask them. Have you ever lied? Do you know what sin is? First of all, do you know what sin is? And it's just missing the mark. And we've all sinned. The Bible says we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then you would point out, and we remember we've got to draw this out in them. They've got to admit that they have sin in their life. <clears throat> so have you ever lied? And they'll say, well, yeah, what do you call someone who's lied? Uh, a liar? Okay, so have you ever stolen anything? Yeah, I, I've stolen. Well, what do you call someone who steals? A thief. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust in your eyes? Jesus said, if you look upon a woman with lust, then, then you have committed adultery. Have you ever done that? What do you call it? You know, you're an adulteress. Have you ever blasphemed the Word of God? Have you ever used God's name as a cuss word? Well, yeah, done that. That's blaspheme. That's, that's very serious. And, and so, by your own admission, you're a lying, cheating, stealing, a thieving blasphemer. You know, <laughs> so by your own admission, do you think that uh, when you come, when come to Judgment Day, uh, you would be guilty or innocent. And so that brings out that sin in their life. And that's what Christ did here with her. He told her that she's had five husbands and the one you're living with now is not even your husband. So she is in sin. And he just brought that out. And she saw that. So the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So, some people, when they're reading this, they, uh, they think that she's changing the subject. And at first glance, you think, okay, well, yeah, she might be changing the subject because she's a feeling a little uncomfortable. So, uh, so she's like, well... She starts, she moved the whole thing into religion now instead of, we were, we're talking about her sin here and now it's a little uncomfortable for her. But what I think, I think uh, she knows that she's in the presence of someone very special and she's going to take advantage of this because she's got questions. Maybe in her life she's like, well, I don't know why we can't get along with the Jews. But we have to worship up here. They worship down here. What's right? What's right? You know, we've seen that in our life. <coughs> You've got all these different religions. Okay, Let, let's let's just talk. Not even we won't even talk about the cults and the 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 non-Christian religions. I'm not <laughs> going to go there today. Let's just talk about all the denominations and the religions of the Christian faith. Because when I was growing up, I would ask, well. Which one's right? How do we know which one's right? So, what we believe over here, they don't believe over there, and what they believe over there, they think we're wrong. So who's right? Well, that's her thinking here. She's like, well, we do this and you do that. Well, who's right? So she's got the opportunity to ask a prophet because he just told her all that she's done, and she never even told him. So she knows that she's with someone special. So now she's asking him, what's the right thing? What, what's the right thing? And he's going to tell her in just a minute. <laughs> Jesus said to her in verse 21, Woman, believe me, uh, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So that's the answer. <laughs> he didn't even say that what they were doing was right or wrong or what... what that Jerusalem is right or wrong. He just said in the, there's going to come a day that uh, you're not going to worship here nor there. You're going to worship everywhere because Christ brought the Holy Spirit to us and that we can worship God in spirit and in truth anywhere we're at. We don't need Jerusalem or the mountain in Syria to worship God. We can worship Him right where we're at. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, 
for such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. So when we worship Him in spirit and in truth, that's who God is seeking for us to worship. Excuse me, I'm going to blow my nose. Pardon me. <laughs> so we must worship Him in spirit and truth. And the woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called the Christ. When that one comes, He will declare all things to us. So she says, I know that this Messiah is coming. And then John adds in there, one who is called the Christ, which means the Messiah, the, the one, uh, He is the uh, God with us. He is the, 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 the King of the Jews, the King of the world. And when that one comes, He will declare all things to us. So she's saying, I'm looking for the Christ to come. I'm looking for the Messiah to come. And He'll tell us everything. And she... Uh, so she, she moves her attention back to what <laughs> is most important. She believed in the coming of the Messiah. And that's what how you were saved before Messiah. You believed in the Messiah, see? You believed in the Messiah as future. Now we believe in the Messiah as past and present and future. Yeah, and future. But they, they looked forward to the Messiah. And we see what He did in the past for us. So that's all coming to, to the, the center, central point. In fact, it is such an important point in time that we gauge our time on what the Messiah did. We have before Christ, and we have the year of our Lord, which means a a Anno Domini, is A.D., which is the year of our Lord. So our time and our, our years that we have today is based off of what He did 2,000 years ago. So Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Now, in your Bibles, you'll either have the brackets or italics words when they are added for clarification. Now, that's that, all that means is it's not in the original text. It's not in the original Greek that the New Testament is written in. They add these words sometimes to give clarification. So when you're reading, it's, it makes more sense. Sometimes they screw up. And I believe this is one of those incidences where they screw up. Because if you read this without the he in there, go to verse 26 and read what your Bible says. It'll, it'll say something like this. I who speak to you am he. Okay? That's what yours says? Okay. Is the he in italics or is it blocked? Italics. Italics? Blocked? Any blocks? Whole things italics? Okay. You don't have anything on yours? Okay, well that, the word he there is added for clarification. Alright, so what this should say is I who speak to you am. Period. Because if you take who speaks to you, Jesus is saying here, I am. Yeah. He is declaring himself as the I am of the burning bush. This is one of the I am statements. So I am he who speaks to you. Okay? Changes the whole meaning of that verse if you read it how it was intended to be read. And no doubt, she knew who the I am was. She's, you know, a, a descendant of, of uh, Abraham. She knew Moses. She knew the stories of the burning bush. So when he says, I am who speaks to you, she knew exactly what he was saying. So, point number seven of the how to witness like Christ is to keep the conversation on the gospel, right? So we got to keep the conversation on the gospel. She moved the conversation away on the religion and he brought it back to the gospel. <laughs> so I who speak to you am. I am. 
And so that brings us to eight. The eighth point is tell what Jesus can do for their sin problem. The I am can take care of her sin problem, right? Uh, and then you have the invitation. We can't forget the invitation. We we bring them to this point, and then we got to ask them. So, is this something that you would like to do? <laughs> is this something that you would, in your life, are you ready to turn yourself over to the Lord? Are you ready to make Him the Lord of your life? Because He's got to be the Lord of your life <laughs> in order for you to be a Christian. You've got to make Him your Lord in order to be saved. So, to be saved is to trust in what He did for you, to repent of the sin that we just knew you, that you know you have. You turn away from that and you turn to Him and you trust in Him and make Him your boss. Make Him your Lord. When you do that, you will be saved. You will be born again. And then the Spirit of God will come inside of you and be a part of you and help you live your life. That is the Gospel. That is witnessing Jesus' stuff. Verse 27, At this point His disciples came, and they were amazed that He had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek? Or, Why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, I right, notice... Notice uh, she went to the men of the city. Okay? Or midday. She leaves her water pot there. She's excited. She goes in and... What's that? To the people? Okay. Well, and, and it may have... Maybe. And maybe that's a better translation. I just happened to... Mine said men. So I just... So if... I could just leave this point that I was going to make out because I don't know now for sure. <laughs> so anyway, the most exciting part is she's excited so much that she left what she was doing. She was getting water and she decided that uh, that's not important anymore. The Messiah is here and I'm going to tell everybody. So she goes to the city and she tells the people that Christ, the Messiah, is here. So she got saved. Okay, Because when you get saved, you want to go tell everybody. When you get saved, you get excited. So she believed in the Messiah because she already believed in the Messiah. She just didn't realize who she was talking to. But as soon as he said, I am he, or I am, the one who's talking to you is the I am, then she believed. And she dropped her pot. She took off. She was going to tell everybody in the city, that the Messiah is here. And uh, <clears throat> so she says, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. So they left the city and they came to where the Messiah is. So she got saved. She got excited, and now she is spreading the word. And that's how, that's how Christianity works. You get saved, you get excited, and now you spread the word. And you're going to bring a lot more with you. And then what we're going to talk about next week is how the harvest is ripe. Because we're going to see the people of the city coming to the Messiah. And they're going to, he's going to see, see the, the fields ripe, white with right with harvest. He wasn't talking about the wheat fields. He was talking about the people. We're going to see that next week. But what? So for in in um, so what we were going through today, number one was Jesus initiates the conversation. So we need to initiate the conversation. Draws he draws her attention to the true gospel. He he gives her a glimpse of what she's gained to, uh, is to gain from the gospel. Gives a little more information, but just enough to pique her interest. Then he will expose the sin in her life. 
then he keeps the conversation on the gospel because when you start talking about sin, people start getting uncomfortable and they want to start, well, what about all the, you know, the, the, the tribes in South Africa that has no missionaries there? What happens to them when God judges the world? You know, nobody's there to tell them. See, they're getting you off. They're getting you on something else. And that's, that's well, I hear that more than anything else. So what about the people that don't hear about the gospel? Well, you're the one hearing about the gospel right now. What are you going to do about it? It's not about them. It's about you right now. It's about what God is doing for you. If God wants to get to them, He'll give them a dream. Or whatever. He's reached them. There's, there's tribes that's never had a, a missionary ever come to their tribe that are Christ followers. And so it's about bringing them back to the gospel. So keep the conversation on the gospel and not on religion. Um, and then... Number eight, tell what Jesus can do for their sin problem. Because Jesus is the only thing that we have for our sin problem. That we can't be good enough. We can't do anything to help us. Because, <coughs> let, me, let me tell you something else. And then we have the invitation. But let me tell you one other thing real quick and then we'll close. Sin is not what sends you to hell. No one will be in hell because they're sinners. Okay? Don't, don't misunderstand me here. Now, think, think clearly. You will not go to hell because you're a sinner. You will go to hell because you reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It is a choice we all have. Um, because, And there is no good people in heaven. <laughs> okay? There's going to be a lot of good people in hell. And there's going to be saved people in heaven. See, we're not good people. We don't go to heaven because we're good. We go to heaven because we are saved. We go to heaven because we are reborn. And to be reborn is to accept the gospel, the good news for what it is. And accept that we are sinful people and we must turn away from our sinful ways and trust in the Lord. We're not going to stop sinning. Okay, we will still be sinners, <laughs> unfortunately, until we're translated out of this life and into the next. But we will be eternally with God in heaven if we choose to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you <clears throat> for giving us your word, and we thank you for... Uh, for saving us. Lord, we know we can't do it ourselves. And Lord, we know that <coughs> you were the only way of salvation. That uh, it's not of ourselves lest we boast. No, we did it ourselves. And Father, I just pray that you give us each um, that burning desire to tell somebody about our faith. That burning desire to tell others about <laughs> Uh, what you've done for us. It's like the Samaritan woman. She went and she told the whole city what she, what she just decided. Help us to get that spark in our life again. If, it's, if we're old Christians or new Christians, or, uh, it doesn't matter. Just bring up that, bring that spark in our life again to where we remember what it was like when we first became a Christian and how we wanted to tell everybody. Father, help us to get that and uh, help us to tell everyone. And if there's anyone out there listening to this on, on the video or here today that's not made Christ your Savior, have, has never decided to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, <laughs> then if you're ready to do that now, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that He said that you must be saved because we don't know if we're going to have tomorrow. Don't put off tomorrow what we can do today. And if you want to make a decision to trust in Him today, pray this prayer with me. Lord, I believe that You died for me and that You were raised from the dead. And I make You my Lord. Jesus, I make You my Lord. And I turn from my sin. And I make You the Lord of my life. Help me to live each and every day for you.
and help me to tell others about you. And if you've prayed that prayer today, and if you met it with your heart, then welcome to the family of God, and the angels in heaven are rejoicing today with you. And uh, Lord, I bless you. I, Lord, bless. I, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and grant and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. Amen. Hey, Ha <laughs> ha